Do you love coffee and Monero as much as we do? Consider making gratuitous.org your daily cup. Pay with Monero for premium fresh beans, and if you like what you taste, send a digital cash tip directly to the Guatemalan farmers that made it possible. Proceeds help us grow this channel, Gratuitous, and Monero. This week on Monero Talk is sponsored by Cake Wallet. Store, send, receive, and exchange your Monero and Bitcoin safely on iOS and Android too. Cake Wallet is open source, and you always control your own keys. And by Sweetwater Digital Asset Consulting, connecting new money with old money since 2018. Cake Wallet and Sweetwater Digital are trusted and verified by the Monero community. Monero Talk is also made possible from contributions by viewers and listeners like you. This week on Monero Talk. Douglas Tuman interviewed Jason Brett. Jason is a former U.S. regulator with the FDIC serving in the capital markets and finance divisions during the global financial crisis of 2008. With the introduction of Bitcoin by a colleague in 2016, he entered into the blockchain industry, first with the Chamber of Digital Commerce, as Director of Operations for Policy, and then as the Policy Ambassador for Consensus. He is currently the founding CEO and President of a new nonprofit called the Value Technology Foundation and is a contributor to the Crypto and Blockchain Division of Forbes. Doug and Jason discuss the Value Technology Foundation and if it supports projects like Monero, what Jason sees as being some of the issues with the current banking and financial system, and where he thinks the regulation of cryptocurrencies, in particular Monero, is headed and the root of what regulators are concerned about. Monero Talk starts now. All right, Jason. Douglas, how are you? Thank, thank you for coming on, man. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me. So I guess we'll, we'll jump right into it. So I met you on Clubhouse. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, that was kind of, I think that was like one of my my first or second week. So I, I was really binging on Clubhouse. Uh, I've, I've since calmed down a little bit. How about yourself? Are you still in the uh, addictive Clubhouse stage or have you... Uh, yeah, I've been you, doing it probably more than I should, but uh, there's worse hobbies. So yeah, I've been there for a while. It's an ama amazing resource, right? It feels like something that should have existed, you know, 10 years ago. Yeah, I like it a lot. You know, I'm actually trying to get a congressman to join on uh, the Cafe Bitcoin Now, uh, Congressman Ro Khanna from California. Um, it's funny, I, I, he tweeted out about Bitcoin and using, you know, trying to get it to be more clean energy and I invited him on and he's so he'd be willing to come on. So we're just waiting to hear back. Yeah, I saw that. So you seem to be uh, in with the in with the DC crowd, so to speak. Uh, how, yeah. how is that? How did that happen? What what exactly is your position, your 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 day job? I guess how how did you uh, get involved in the in the DC crypto scene? Yeah. So um, I started in. I moved actually from New Jersey originally. But I moved to D.C. to go get my MBA at American University, um, Kogut School of Business. And during that time, I got an internship at the FDIC, which was during the financial crisis. And so I ended up just sort of staying there as a regulator for about six years. Um, and then in 2016, I discovered blockchain technology and uh, worked for the Chamber of Digital Commerce, which was a nonprofit. And I was their director of operations uh, for policy for both international, state and federal issues. So I started learning all about the space. It was great. And, um, and then I, I, actually, I got a chance to help write a white paper on smart contracts um, where we got a forward from Nick Zabo. And we did this like event in New York City. That was pretty cool where I actually got to introduce Nick Zabo. So that was fun. Um, and then I got a job offer from Joe Lubin at Consensus in Brooklyn. I was in Brooklyn maybe four or five times, but I was mainly in D.C. doing their government and policy relations. And I do that now with a company called Keybridge Advisors, where I help with um, folks in the crypto Bitcoin space in terms of different issues and help with lobbying and, and, and relations with regulators as well. Very cool. And you're starting, you run the Value Technology Foundation, correct? Yeah, I'm running the Value Technology Foundation. It's a 501c3. Um, we have some contracts with some of the um, uh, federal agencies um, with education, blockchain and, and Bitcoin education. Um, areas around like use of cryptocurrency, perhaps for like 
illicit purposes and sort of just helping with education for people that just don't know anything about them. And it's a, it's a nonprofit that we started a couple of years ago. Cool. So what, what really, uh, what really motivates you? What's kind of the, the driving force behind your career decisions? What's, yeah, what's your yeah. motivation? Yeah. How did I up here? It's a good question. <laughs> um, you know, I, when I was uh, working at the FDIC and I was on another podcast a while ago, I, I tell the story um, and it kind of clicks pretty quickly for people in terms of those who are in like the Bitcoin Monero world. Mm -hmm. um, I worked as a regulator at the FDIC as an intern my, between my first and second years of my MBA. And literally I got there and they said, oh, it's very quiet. It was like 2008. They have plenty of money in the uh, deposit insurance fund. And then like a month later, everything went, you know, to shit, um, for lack of a better term. My boss went out to California. And what I realized was I was given this assignment, which was wild because I was right at the very beginning of the crisis where I had to help the FDIC board with a spreadsheet showing how people were taking their money out of IndyMac Bank. And it was by like age and everything. And I had to do all this evaluation. And basically what we figured out or what the senior guys figured out and I, we looked at was that there were a lot of YouTube videos that were filming all the people who had been through the Great Depression and been trying to get their money out of the banks a second time. And then all the people in their 20s, 30s and 40s just started running on the bank as a result of the fact that they saw people on YouTube. So it was really the first social media crisis. And it just blew me away because all of a sudden I realized like it was about getting the trust of the American people. It wasn't that there was enough money to just give out to everybody. Uh, it's that people have to trust the banking system or the system doesn't really work. And, you know, um, as I started to think about that, I was like, this is a bit of a crack in the trust, you know, for the American people. And sure enough, as Bitcoin came out, I realized that there's this new generation of people who are tired of getting 0% interest rate. They don't trust the banks. They're looking for alternatives. And I've just really been enjoyed being in that space, realizing that, you know, this is all just trying to create a new form of trust and money um, for a generation that kind of really got messed up with 2008, 2009. Is really amazing the timing of everything, right? I guess uh, necessity is the mother of of all inventions, so they say. So I, th I think Bitcoin is the perfect example of that. Seems to have come at a perfect time. Yeah. What um what else can you tell me about the FDIC? I mean, it's something you know. I know I know what it is, but I don't really know what it is. I, I find that funny too. Like, so people look at Bitcoin and they're often. Uh, you know, very confused by it initially. They they can't really wrap their mind around it. But at the end of the day, it is only 11 pages and it's something you can sit and read and ultimately understand. The, I find it harder to understand our current banking system than, than how, you know, than Bitcoin. So what, what could you tell me about that? How, how do things really work behind the scenes? Well, the FDIC started in 1933 as a temporary agency and basically it was more the people it wasn't even the president president roosevelt didn't really want it congress didn't really want it but a lot of people were fed up because they just saw their life savings disappear overnight and i mean back then you had bankers in the street you know selling shares of stock just to get money behind the, the counter by 4 p.m um and it was really bad so like the fdic's purpose and the goal is to make sure as an insurance company first and foremost that everybody gets paid out everything that they're owed based on the deposit insurance for every account that they have up to $250,000 is what it was. It started out as up to $10,000. It got moved during the financial crisis from 100 to 250. So it's essentially an insurance company uh, for any deposits you have in the bank in the case of a bank failure. However, since the um, crisis, the FDIC has taken on a couple of new roles and they've really become one of the leading regulators in terms of these, I'm sure you've heard the term too big to fail banks. So they really help with the stress tests. They do a coordinated effort with the Federal Reserve and the OCC on making sure these large banks have a, a receivership plan or a will, living will, if you will, to um, to wind down. So that's really become one of their newer responsibilities. Um, and they're responsible for winding down banks. They're still winding down banks from the 80s. Um, you know, receiverships, they take over a bank, you know, you know just from behind the scenes, the joke is among bankers, uh, that you never want the FDIC to show up on a Friday afternoon. That means your bank's probably about to be closed down. So it's always like, oh, the FDIC, don't tell me the FDIC is coming on a Friday afternoon. That's always the joke. Um, and, and so they do the closings too. They literally will come into a bank. They, they take it over. They work with the management and the staff to help coordinate everybody if it's like being sold to a different bank or simply pay out deposits as you would any, any insurance claim. 
So what what do you see as being some of the uh, major issues with the current banking system and financial system and you know the and and the fiat system? I know I know that's a big question, but uh, I imagine you you must have some some concerns given that you're uh, you know into crypto now. Uh, I guess you're you're primarily a Bitcoiner. Is that is that fair yeah. to say? Mm -hmm. uh, so what is what is your what are your concerns? Why do why do we need Bitcoin? Uh, what what problems is it solving? I guess is the easiest uh, way to ask it. Um, well, it's interesting too because I'm excited to talk to you about Monero on a, a specific problem. I really hope it does solve. But mm -hmm. um, for me, uh, Bitcoin is is resembled something where I think people have ultimately lost uh, confidence in their money, and it's people are more educated than ever thanks to the internet about the fact of what inflation does to the value of their dollar. Um, people sort of point back to 1971 about when we went off the gold standard. Um, to be honest, like when you talk about fiat currency, I think fiat has its use cases. I mean, fiat had its use case in 1863 when the OCC started and the North needed to raise money to fight the Civil War. You know, I mean, that was a use case of printing paper money. And at the time, that wasn't backed by gold, um, but it was creating debt, right? Debt to the banks. And it's based on that central bank having a debit credit system where we owe the money back to the bank and they can increase the size of their balance sheet as we've seen over the last 12 years and i saw that back at the fdic in 0809 in fact one of my projects was to keep track of what the federal reserve was doing and so every time they had a project my spreadsheet got bigger and bigger i remember started with like one and it got up to like 10 or 11 projects uh, of different ways the federal reserve was creating money and that was just in 08 you know so um People have seen, I think, this increase of the amount of money in the in the financial system. And uh, again, I think it just goes back to that shake in confidence of people feeling, uh, it's interesting to talk about it now, because I think people feel like with the internet, I don't know about you, but there's this democratization of information. And so with that, there's this, you know, people are tougher consumers, right? You can go to Yelp, you can go to places. So people are getting tougher on things like the Federal Reserve and others who so really have more insights and as more people have that knowledge, I think what Bitcoin does fix, as it were, is this idea that the dollar is the only kind of currency that you can or should use and that you might have a new store of value similar to the way people learn to use email and communications over the Internet. Yeah, I think it really offers uh, competition, right? It offers uh, competition to fiat. Um, so you seem to understand that obviously you understand the regulation world pretty well. Uh, that's how I ran into you. So I ran into you on Clubhouse. I think on that particular day, we were you were basically um, broadcasting one of the congressional subcommittees that was taking place, oh, yeah. and the topic was how uh, terrorist groups and primarily um, right wing extremist groups were what what means they were using to fund their activities, and inevitably cryptocurrency came up. Uh, first, Bitcoin came up, and then eventually it arrived at privacy coins. I don't like to call them privacy coins, by the way. Uh, and they were brought up, and I forget the guy's name. I believe David Glad Gladstein. Gladstein, I believe is. Um, you mean the person that I had on stage with me? No, on the on the congressional subcommittee. Yes, David Gladstein he, from the yeah, he was from yeah, he was the expert. Uh, there was a congressman who brought up Monero, and then he responded with, you know, perhaps coins like these need to be banned, essentially, is, is what yep. the language that was used. Um, so do you think that's the direction things might, where we might be headed in terms of uh, regulation in the United States? Is, or is that just banter that was taking place? Or is that a, is that a sign of things to come? Well, you know, it's interesting because the, the context around that hearing is really important, right? Because that was a hearing about how there might have been somebody from France, this person who was a suicidal Frenchman, who had sent Bitcoin to one of the folks in the alt-right movement that seemed to be involved in the takeover of the capital. And where that really was coming from, um, the nervousness around these altcoins or whatever it would be, you know, um, sorry, privacy coins, is that... If, if, if there was this issue in 9-11, remember how we sort of shut down all the foreign terrorist concepts and really affected the impact to people's rights and, um, you know, really like sending them to Guantanamo Bay is there was this attitude of, you know, the people here in America, if they're going to cause domestic terrorism, you know, like it says in the Constitution, threats foreign or domestic, we should be trying to cut these folks off at the past too. 
So there are a lot of bills in that particular um, Congress uh, subcommittee. One was about FinCEN. It actually said if you're if you're arrested, not just convicted, but arrested of, uh, you know, subversion, domestic terrorism, um, causing inciting a rebellion, that you can be arrested and all of your bank accounts get shut down, every single one. And then you have to like petition forever to get them to be reopened. Um, well, what the real concern was, and, and you were hearing, I think, from Congressman Stephen Lynch, which is the chair of the um, FinTech Task Force, is he's like, why don't we just button everything up by taking all the um, cold wallets and just, you know, closing off that loophole, making sure we just see what who holds what of every single coin, whether it's Monero, Bitcoin, Ethereum, didn't matter. And um, so I wouldn't say it, it's something to just sort of like, oh, they sort of brought it up. I think as you know, probably, especially living, you know, near New York City, like 9-11 changed a lot of things in this country about the way we deal with rights, both at home and abroad. And so in that context of this hearing of we absolutely have to do everything possible so this something like the takeover in the Capitol can never happen again, to me means maybe they will go so far as banning privacy coins or whatever they feel they need to do. So they literally, you know, as they did kind of with, with the foreign terrorists, just do whatever it took to cut them off financially. So I am concerned about where that might go. Yeah, I looked it up. So Daniel Glazer, I'm sorry, that was his name, right? Daniel yes. Glazer? Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, just curious. So like that, do you know anything about this? I'm trying to understand this well. Like who, who, who is this guy? I mean, he's, he's up there. He's, he's making this basically this, um, he's, he's the expert, right? That was there that day. Yeah. Uh, it's just a little scary to me that, you know, we have this congressional subcommittee listening to this gentleman who's basically calling for the banning of, of an entire technology that, uh, you know, it's open source, uh, its purpose is to allow for the free flow of, of information, essentially. Um, who is this guy? And like, how, how, what, can you give me any insight into how things work behind the scenes in Congress with these subcommittees and who these experts are that are brought in and any, any, Anything you could elucidate there, I, I would love to learn more about that. Sure. Yeah. So it was Daniel Glazer, and um, he uh, works for the Foundation for Defense of Democracies. And the reason he was an expert, rightly so an expert, was he used to work at the uh, uh, FinCEN, right, which is Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, um, where I think he was Assistant uh, Treasury Secretary. So he's the one that would be sort of on the front lines of figuring out what FinCEN has been working on since 2013, which is making these determination over different currencies and whether they're a threat in terms of, you know, crimes, whether it's money laundering, anti-terrorist issues. So Daniel Glazer probably got picked as he got picked among the other few uh, witnesses there to go to testify to Congress. And the Foundation for Demands of Democracies is talking about making sure there are ways just like with um there's a few other sort of these think tanks that worry about if a particular vir virtual currency were to grow how might that be used at a mass scale right so he's sort of coming at it as an expert having formerly worked at government and so he's an expert on the panel um it's funny because if you notice that he didn't really talk too much about cryptocurrencies it wasn't really on his mind but the 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 chairman and um the discussion was very clear uh, because they wanted to understand how things like Monero works. And I think ultimately that's he sort of threw the anon anonymous enhanced digital currencies kind of under the bus as a way of like, well, let's just cut these off, but keep the other ones kind of going um, if they wanted to take some kind of action. And that doesn't surprise me if you know FinCEN, if you go back to, I don't know if you were at Consensus 2019 in Manhattan, but the uh, FinCEN came they actually came and spoke in a headline and they actually were really slammed Monero. They talked about, this is the problem. This is the issue. It's funny because if you actually talk to the organizers at consensus, the FinCEN folks asked to be like on prime time. Like they wanted to be the first speaker, the first, you know, keynote to really make their point to everybody there that you need to like follow these rules or else. So uh, it's an enforcement division, you know, it's, it's like any other enforcement division. It's not like a regulator, like I was at the FDIC. I mean, these are people that can put you in jail. And obviously FinCEN is very, very concerned in general about things relating to virtual currencies. So they're still trying to understand it. And they're just worried maybe some stuff gets used in a way like with tumblers or whatever that they can't follow it or Monero. That's what scares them, that they can't trace the money. Yeah. 
Well, what's your take on that? So, you know, you run your, your policy group. Um, are you guys in support of Monero? So the Value Technology Foundation. Are you guys, do you guys support Monero and, and projects like it? So we don't support any projects at all. We're completely neutral. Um, we don't even support Bitcoin. Um, what we do is we try to be a neutral broker of information for people in the government where we evaluate everything fairly. And, and the reason for that on the value technology side is because we get contracts with the government where we want to do our own think tank stuff. So like there was this example where we couldn't get a contract. We worked with folks at Consensus wanted to work with us, but we can't use Ethereum. So, you know, we, we can't just say, hey, we're absolutely have to use Ethereum. So we, we don't we don't stand by any one particular project. However, we do pick certain projects based on principles that could be useful and we think are important. One of the things that we we have decided as Value Technology Foundation is the privacy is a very important thing, especially in the digital age. And I'm personally looking into, and I hope that we have some kind of paper around the potential usefulness of Monero actually in a very positive way of uh, your, I'm sure chairman, uh, former chairman CFTC, Giancarlo, talks about the digital dollar project and having this digital dollar where it's like you have cash on the internet, you know, that can be used just like we use cash in real life and no one can track you. I don't know that Bitcoin can do that, but I think Monero can. And I want I want us to find out if in fact, maybe that is the use case for Monero, having a form of cash that's actually used by the US government, um, you know, to provide that service to people. Because I just think, I worry a lot about the uh, ability to surveil uh, our use of digital money. Yeah, and you know, I obviously think it's a po uh, it's a good thing, and you know, uh, I, I I say it all the time on the show, and I go into the philosophical reasons for why I think so. What arguments do you think need to be made uh, to legislators, to Congress, to these regulators, so that you know maybe they start to hopefully agree and think of how to allow this technology to flourish as opposed to trying to stifle it. Yeah, thanks for that uh, question. You know, um, there's a project that is being run in DARPA called Project Brandeis. And Project Brandeis is this focus on how can you get privacy in a digital age online. And the problem I have with sort of the angle that they're coming at Project Brandeis, obviously after Supreme Court Justice Brandeis, who, you know, talked about right of privacy, is there's a little bit of a like a, a give and take. like. OK, so there's a lot of data out there, but still have we have this digital identity that's private. So in other words, it's not perfect. You know, people still can kind of figure out who you are, like the pseudonymous Bitcoin form. Um, but at the same time, you know, you just kind of have to deal with the fact that you, you're kind of private, but people can still figure out where you are and what you're doing, uh, which always just means that someone can figure out what you are doing at any time, even if you're a law abiding citizen. Um, I think that the angle and I think the discussion should be and I think there should be some kind of study or even commission by the Biden administration um, to really look into a, a formal study across the government as to how we can make sure we're not surveilling our citizens actively. And what are the different financial tools that can be used um, to start making sure that there is a place for people who want to keep their privacy if we move away completely from like physical cash. And so that would be where I would think Monero would be a good candidate or any uh, anonymous enhanced cryptocurrency uh, to be part of that study and any other tools that we might look at as a way of preventing surveillance. Because I think that's really the, um, uh, what are we giving up to, you know, to keep ourselves all safe, but at the same time, there should be at least a part of the internet and a part of the place where people can do things and don't have to have a, a monitor. There should be no trails of dust. It's, it's not like it's an odd concept, right? I mean, we have right to be forgotten in you know, Europe. So it's the same principle. Yeah, do you think maybe Europe becomes one of the the safe havens, and you know we we have a little bit of a dark ages here in the U.S. regarding technology like Monero? Any any predictions there on how things play out? Um, so I don't know. I mean, I mean, you would probably know better than me, as I'm definitely not an expert on Monero, but I am interested in it for what it can provide. But I don't really know about how beneficial or what it would really do to actually make it that you can't use Monero. It would stop some people from using it. But how would that stop everyone, you know, from from actually using it on a regular basis? I do think um, Europe could be a place that that could turn into. Um, I don't think Europe really wants that. So, um, but I do think that the, it's interesting, right? Because if you go back in time, 
when the internet was, you know, growing a worldwide web, all the companies were in the US. And that's why we have sort of the economy we have today. Now it's like about a 50 50 split, you know, the major companies in crypto and blockchain, half of them are really in China and half of them are in the US. And that's, that's a bad statistic, you know, from the perspective that it used to be 100%. So there is this risk of whether it's China or Europe of seeing uh, an outflow of, of talent, you know, from the US. And yes, I'd say call it a medieval age, really, um, of technology mm -hmm. for our, our, our kids or grandkids. What are what are regulators really concerned about when they look at these technologies, particularly Monero? Is it is it money laundering? Is it tax evasion? What what are, what's like what's the real root of their concerns? Yeah, um, a couple of things. One, I think that they're serving their country, so they have the mission of the agency that they're working for, and they, they honestly want to try to prevent these things like money laundering or whatever. Um, unfortunately, in the United States, as you know, there's lots of regulators and it's a very disjointed system, you know, where there's the Treasury, there's FDIC, SEC, CFTC, there's all these different regulators, and they all have their own turf. And unfortunately, it's very natural, I think, that the leaders of these regulators try to protect that turf. So like even in the financial crisis, there was this issue of, you know, is the Federal Reserve going to gain or lose? Is the FDIC going to gain or lose? Like who's going to stay? like uh, competitive as a regulator, like for instance, the OTS was closed after the financial crisis, they took all the blame for the IndyMac bank. So if you think about it, should that really be your concern during a financial crisis is how's your business going to compete with the other regulators, you know, it really shouldn't be the priority. But I would say that 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 is part of the equation. And so uh, like anything in politics, part of it is politics. Yeah. So you, you mentioned like the think tanks, right? The think tanks that are, are behind uh, a lot of the legislation that ultimately gets passed. Who, who would be behind these think like who, who's what money is supporting these think tanks that potentially uh, want to, you know, regulate something like Monero? Yeah. So I think that's a really great place to start because that's like uh, follow the money. And um, very often it's uh, companies that have a vested, vested interest, I can't think of who off the top of my head, but of, of really not seeing these anonymity enhanced cryptocurrencies succeed. Um, but it is sometimes offered by companies, you know, the way DC works is think tanks are a way of sort of this, this sort of parallel lobbying universe, right? I mean, they changed the whole rules about lobbying a while ago where there, there are these lobbying disclosure agreements but they still estimate that there's about twice the amount of lobbying that happens compared to what's reporting. And a lot of that is because a think tank can have somebody go testify, like a, you know, our friend who went to testify against, you know, Monero at the hearing, they can, you know, write comment letters. Lobbying is this very, uh, you know, narrowly defined concept of if I go to you as a congressman and I actually talk to you in your office about something, then I have to mark it as, okay, I actually lobbied about a bill. But if I just go testify about it at a hearing, that doesn't count as lobbying. So the think tanks have built up a great business of companies that want to influence the discussion in DC by funding certain, uh, like I would say, different lines of thought uh, that are very targeted. One of them I've seen that has bothered me for some time, and it isn't just this think tank, there's a few other think tanks that have really just overall been involved in this concept that one day, because of Monero, and because of Bitcoin, if we just let it grow the way it's going to grow, that we're going to have, you know, the next like terrorist bomb go off in Manhattan, you know, and that's going to be because we let virtual currencies grow at scale. So my problem with that is always we should be managing things like that. But you're assuming that's already happening and you're going backward from that. So I, I think you need to actually when you do these research papers and you really look at it from an independent standpoint, is it really going to be something like Monero that's going to fund something like that? Or is it going to be cash, right? $100 bills. That's what's still all over the world. There's 75% of the um, you know, $100 bills are in mattresses all over the world. It's, it's the way the currency goes. It's the way these terrorists move money around, vast majority of it. This is a small slither of something that, yes, it could grow at scale. But I would rather, well, I would rather have something like Bitcoin where you could trace. And I think that's where the trade-off you have to decide of. How does Monero exist in that area if, if people get used to things like chain analysis that can track uh, currencies like Bitcoin? Yeah, you're saying you would rather have something like Bitcoin where you could trace? I'm sorry, that last yeah, part. So, yeah, well, I, I, I'm saying 
as terrorists have been using Bitcoin, they've been discovered, right? Because they it's synonymous and they don't realize yeah. an address, they think they can just get all this money and then the FBI shows up at their door. So I think that um, that's 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 a benefit to Bitcoin, at least. And the way I like that, the way that works is to me, that's a little bit like kind of like a wiretap on a phone, right? Where, it, you know, you need to go through a judge. And if you feel somebody's doing something wrong, you can follow where that money goes in that instance. So I would say that's a benefit. I'm not saying necessarily it's great that it happens, but it's just it's happened that that's a benefit for Bitcoin, which is what the authorities really like about it, which is why I think you're seeing this this assault on, on Monero and on anonymous enhanced currencies, because in a way, Bitcoin's kind of spoiled them, right? They feel like yeah. they can stuff with Bitcoin, but wait, we can't do it with this. So let's just get rid of this stuff. Yeah, I mean, I would say Bitcoin you know, goes well, way beyond what, uh, you know, regulators are used to with cur the current technology and the current financial system and even things like uh, current communication systems in providing this ability to essentially surveil, right? Because at the end of the day, it is a perfectly transparent ledger where all these transactions are taking place and you could essentially... Uh, watch all the transactions and uh, very easily with enough resources, make the connections from the inroads of exchanges of who's who and associate them with wallets. Mm -hmm. um, and with, you know, traditional banking and even traditional communication, it's it's more difficult to, to make these con connections and track and trace. So it's kind of, uh, you know, it's moving beyond. And that's that's what scares me is that it's actually giving up too much, right? Whereas Monero is actually more analogous to the current cash system, for example, right? You go, you take cash out of the bank. Once you, once you take that $10,000 out of the bank, you're not forever tracked and traced and they don't know instantly know what you've done with that cash. Um, with Bitcoin, they essentially, they do. Uh, with Monero, you're back to cash, right? And, you know, if you are suspected of a crime or doing some nefarious things, then you use traditional police work. You use, you know, uh, the means that you have through the Fourth Amendment to, to, to search and seize. And then you go and look. But with Bitcoin, it's like they don't even have to do that. They can they have that all seeing eye that's turned on at all times. So I kind of see it as uh, circumventing these protections that we have as citizens and it's it's going beyond what's expected in terms of our rights and our privacy that that's that's ultimately my concern there and i don't see those concerns being expressed on the floor of congress which is one of the reasons why i ran um you know so i do see them talking about well you know, this uh, this cryptocurrency stuff, it could be used to fund terrorism. And like you said, the kind of the default answer is, well, actually, Congressman, uh, don't worry about it. Bitcoin is perfectly traceable. So if it is used for those activities, we'll be able to find it. And in fact, all those activities are saved forever. So we could always go back and search it. But I don't hear them making the argument uh, about, you know, free speech and the protection of liberty and that these other technologies, while you can't instantly track and trace, and maybe terrorist activity can take place on them as well, there's arguments to be made as to why, although that's concerning, ultimately, that's the American way and we need to preserve these technologies. Yeah, so I'm a contributor for Forbes.com and I write about all the regulatory policy issues that happen there. The most interesting story I had about this was I got a chance to interview somebody from the Secret Service at, at Department of Homeland Security. And what he told me was, look, it's not about how many people use cryptocurrency in a criminal scenario. These it's crime as a service. They'll use whatever technology they can get their hands on. Bitcoin, Monero, AI, virtual reality, whatever it is, if they can get their goal accomplished of either creating terrorism or laundering money, they will use those tools to their benefit. And so, you know, what that taught me and, and what I thought about ever since he said that is, it's not really about the cryptocurrency. It's not really about the Bitcoin. It's not really about the Monero. And, you know, what's, what's really sad is if we, if we let things continue to go as they are, and, and I hope that you run and, and win 
for Congress next time, by the way, is that I think there needs to be a bit of a thread that's pulled out here where we start to say, look, like we know what's going to happen. They're probably going to take all the best technology of Monero and use that to form the digital cash that they want to form. So people have some privacy that's protected. And so if that's the case, you know, that's like the tale of time, right? It, it, you know, there's always the government and they always hire a private sector contractor to build it. But here they're kind of just usurping, they're probably going to end up usurping Monero and using it because to give people the privacy that they want. But is it really the full level of privacy? Is there this quote unquote backdoor? It's not because they're going to build a backdoor to make sure they can get in if they want. Whereas if we just left Monero as pure as it is built by this decentralized community, then it's not. Um, you know, look, if there was a way that um, we could convince the authorities that we could pay our taxes with Monero and we're tax abiding citizens, they'd probably be okay with it and let it run. And I think if you look at it from the lens of the way uh, it was very well described to me by the Secret Service of, look, it's a tool that will be used, then I, then I think you can move away from this idea of why should the default be Bitcoin or we can just trace everything. I mean, and this is where I'm saying is the principle should be what is our digital freedom, right? We all have our digital icon, you know, you have your digital uh, sort of uh, identity, you know, whether it's in um, Clubhouse where we met or all of these other things. And we can learn so much about each other by just going on the, the web now. We really have this digital identity. And so not only do we have what we've done in our past in like the quote unquote real world, but it's also tracked what we do online. And at a certain point, uh, one or another, it, it, to me, it goes back to what um, uh, Supreme Court Justice Brandeis talked about, which is, you know, there isn't a right to privacy in the Constitution, but there inherently should be that that concept. You know, at some point or another, I don't necessarily want you and you probably don't want me to know what you're doing maybe on a Friday night. Right. We should have some time, some private uh, you know, time to ourselves. And um, I think that's where we're different from countries like China, where they're clearly creating a central bank digital currency to surveil all their citizens and to shut off their digital wallets. Like that's, you know, that's not even like Bitcoin. That's way in the opposite direction. Yeah. Yeah, no, great, great, great points. And yeah, I don't think there's, there's, a, there's no way the government can take the technology of Monero and make their own government version. I mean, it's just, it's just no longer, uh, you know, cryptocurrency at that point right now now it's now it's controlled controlled by the government it's not a non-state owned or non-corporate owned asset uh which is what the you know the real true invention of, of crypto was um and then just so ignoring privacy altogether so i agree with you you know i i do think you know there's potentially a, a penumbra of, of rights there in the constitution that says privacy exists um, and then, you know, we have things like, you know, the Fourth Amendment, right, that we're talking about. Um, and then we also have, obviously, the First Amendment, free speech. So I think I think those are, are things. So even if you ignore privacy and whether or not privacy is a is a constitutional right, um, just the, the fact that could they could they regulate and make something illegal, which at the end of the day is really just software and it's just a ledger that people are using to send data back and forth to each other. Like that seems to cross a lot of lines, whether or not it's about private transactions. It's basically the government saying you can't do math in certain ways, right? I mean, at that point, they're trying to regulate uh, encryption, they're basically uh, and they're and they're regulating speech, right? They're preventing you from writing software, and then they're preventing you from communicating uh, and expressing yourself through that software. So I think even if you ignore the privacy arguments, it seems to be it would be a a, a great overstep to to regulate something like that. Do you have any comments on uh, on that as well? Yeah, um, you know, I like what the former uh, comptroller of the currency, Brian Brooks, uh, had to say about this, who was really great for the whole cryptocurrency ecosystem when he was there. You know, he was the former chief legal officer of Coinbase. And he made a comment that was like, you know, it's a matter of choice and the different options that are available to him. So, like, I could send you a message on my messenger, right, on my iPhone. I could maybe do it on Signal or WhatsApp if maybe I want it to be private. Same thing with money. There's certain things that I want to be that anonymous, anonymous enhanced cryptocurrency where I don't want anybody to know, not my wife, not the government. I want to do what I want to do with some of my money. 
Um, and then there should be ones that are just in regular commerce, you know? And so that's what I like is the optionality. And I think that's what Monero exists for. Why I think you see Ricardo Spagni sort of welcomed in, in sort of with uh, the discussions around Bitcoin. Cause I mean, Bitcoin is obviously the quote unquote king, right? In terms of the leading cryptocurrency, but there is that place. And that's why I think that place deserves to be considered. And we've just, we've started to go down a path in our society of just outright rejecting something, right? And and also not needing to justify other things. Like for instance, with FinCEN, there's an awful lot of resources that's spent. And I don't know if you saw the FinCEN files and others of all this, like one of the bills that they had in this committee hearing that bothered me a lot and I worry about is, um, it was, they wanna actually increase this thing called FinCEN Exchange to help FinCEN do its job better. FinCEN Exchange is a public-private partnership with the banks. Um, so what that's saying is that your your financial transactions, my financial tra transactions, would actually have more eyes on it. So they want to open up the files to more people in the public. And this is supposed to be private, this public-private partnership. But why do we need to expand who's looking at our finances just to help with the safety of the financial system when we're already, not, we're already catching less than 1% of all the stuff that comes through ends up being you know, the result of criminal activity anyway. So it just seems like an awful lot of surveillance. Yeah, definitely. What what should the Monero community be doing to help, you know, uh, stop any potential harming regulations coming down down the pipe here in the USA and I guess elsewhere? What, what could the community do? Well, I think um, there's a few things. I think definitely reaching to some of the folks in Congress who uh, are very much like on the libertarian bent and uh, the concept of uh, like, you know, the Freedom Caucus and Fourth Amendment and, and work with some of those folks to really uh, make sure there is a, um, um, I would say, a base of, of maybe a handful of congressmen and a handful of senators. They're going to regularly defend, you know, Monero or anonymously enhanced cryptocurrencies based on these principles that we're talking about. Um, if you don't have that, it's almost like you're not showing up to play the game because as we talked about earlier, you're going to have these think tanks that are still today producing these reports and it's just their view of how anonymously enhanced cryptocurrencies could be used to, you know, by terrorists or money laundering. So if you think about it, it's a matter of just having somebody to kind of play defense and be able to speak up, whether it's at a committee hearing or whether it's on the floor of Congress, if ever there's, we start to see that going down that road try to develop those advocates now. So in the case that we do see some sort of bill introduced, you'll have somebody who will be sharing their concerns and will be armed with how to explain it, right? Because, you know, you and I know what Monero is, we get the idea, but as you know, like if, if you're in Congress or in the Senate, it's got a lot of things, but if you can be armed with the facts, you can explain exactly where it goes to with the issue of privacy, then they'll be able to defend it as needed. And I think that's what the Monero uh, community should be thinking about doing. Um, making sure it's clear as to what you're standing for, which is to make sure people's rights to privacy are protected. It's not about protecting criminal activity or any of that other stuff. So do you think that there should be like a, a coin center of that's more Monero focused? Would that be something that you think would? I would reach out to coin center. I mean, Jerry Brito, those guys are great. And I mean, they've, I've seen them before talk to agencies like the FBI and others, and maybe they'd be willing to help. Monero. I mean, they help Ethereum, right? They one time they were at DevCon with Ethereum. So maybe they, I mean, they, and they have written some really good stuff on um, China and what they're doing and how we have to be careful with the digital dollar. So yeah, I would think you'd have friends there with that point center, maybe some sort of a, a group to, that kind of helps with a contribution that leads to some sort of paper or some effort mm -hmm. on part to focus on the Monero community. Yeah, I spoke to him. I guess it was probably two years ago now, maybe even longer. But yeah, maybe maybe I'll have to hit them up again. Yeah. Um, let's just talk about so the te the the technicals a, a little bit of of crypto um, in terms of the technology. So once again, ign ignoring privacy. Are you interested in this in this you know in crypto? in terms of the fact that we're saying it's 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 new money it's you know it's a it's digital gold is that something that interests you and excites you because we often talk about that on this program and then we talk about you know bitcoin compared to monero for those purposes 
And once again, even ignoring the privacy factor, just the fact that, you know, if you're saying this is digital gold, it should be fungible is one of the things we're always talking about. Do you have any opinions on that and as to whether or not that's a critical component of money or, or digital gold and whether or not that's something that Bitcoin is being hindered by? That's a really good question. Um, you know, I do care about the way Bitcoin and these other cryptocurrencies are used um, purely on the technicals. I think it's great to have that uh, option of having this, um, you know, type of currency that you don't have to, you know, well, you do need ID for the KYC, but that you can carry around, you can carry on a hard wallet. You know, I have my own Bitcoin miner at home. I have my own like ledger hard wallet. So I really have started to do that sort of pushed my Bitcoin as people have been urging me to sort of get off the exchange and onto a hard wallet. And the next step in my journey is looking at some seed plates and picking out a particular metal seed plate, you know, to do that as well. So I do really appreciate that part of the technology and uh, I have a lot more to learn. Um, I actually think um, from a fungibility standpoint, especially in the world of non fungible tokens, right? That um, I mean, Monero might even be more fungible than than Bitcoin because there is sometimes some trails of dust that's left with the Bitcoin. Um, so I, I do think that um, the fungibility is really a great factor. I, I mean, it's it's uh, it's kind of like how we originally maybe wanted the internet to work, you know, with email, where there might be just this cost, and now we have just this cost of electricity um, that we use or computing power to do certain things. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I definitely think it's critical, and I think the the flaw in Bitcoin has been exposed with things like you know that that congressional hearing when we saw that they were showing you literally saw it right the transactions that were made yeah. uh, from the guy in France and how he made those donations, and you could literally see everybody it went to. Uh, once again, great for for potential police work or fighting nefarious activity but harmful for a technology that's intending on being a means for transacting value in a fluid way, uh, because it's essentially no longer fungible at that point if you can blacklist or mark coins and track and trace. So yeah, I was just curious what your take was on that, on a purely ignore, ignoring regulation and just looking at it purely as technology, one versus the other, and whether or not you think that's kind of a requirement for for money for digital gold well i'm sure previous guests and future guests will say what i'm about to say so i do know the tech enough to say like lightning will fix this right this whole level two technology and the idea of what it's building out to try to prevent that um I, you know the one thing i would say is i don't know if necessarily i would classify it as a failure on bitcoins or a weakness in its part um i, I think that bitcoin originally changed the notion of the of the paradigm of the way we work look at privacy which has helped and benefited you know coins like monero because it moved it to you know your identity is going to be private but all the transactions are going to be public you know and obviously that line has blurred a little bit you know to your point but that's the way the bitcoin blockchain system works it's sort of like the the first initial version of how we can do cash over the internet in a very raw way of having these you know double entry ledgers, everyone can see the blockchain, you can see where the money's gone, the history of it. Um, and, and that's, I think, beneficial that everyone can see that out in the open. Um, obviously, that's had its drawbacks as we still deal with things like IP addresses and other stuff like that. But I would say that is one of the things I don't know to necessarily call it negative for Bitcoin. But I would say that we now look at privacy very differently as a result of Bitcoin and that Monero has benefited from it. Yeah, I should, I should mention view keys too. Are you familiar with Monero view keys? Because I know I talk to a lot of people about Monero, and then they uh, they don't realize that you know you you can view transactions. It's just you know I would have to show you, provide you my view key. So just uh, wanted. Right. To, are you are you familiar with that concept? Mm -mm. No, that sounds great. Yeah, because that's that's something that you know I think obviously regulators need to become cognizant of, right? So it's it's not. I guess it's a black hole, but you know if I want to, you know, point a light on the black hole and show it to you, you, you can see it as a regulator. So you know if a regulator sent me a, a letter in the mail saying you know I need to see all your Monero transactions, in theory I can show that person my transactions without providing them my access to my Monero, just a, uh, a portal to, to see my transactions. Yeah. Yeah. I think when you think about, sorry. 
No, go ahead. Go ahead. I, I think when you think about the um, what we saw on January 6th, which was really, you know, a frightening experience for everyone. I mean, that was the day senators were sort of being sworn in office, people have their families there. Um, you know, it, it brings up a lot of emotions for people. But at the same time, what was pointed out during that hearing and what I think we saw also with 9-11 is it, it, there's a lot, not a lot of cost to do these types of things, right? To go kind of quote unquote, take over the Capitol. I mean, yeah, you need the train ticket, the plane ticket. We really haven't seen something and the point I'm making is we haven't really seen something where someone can say, oh, look, Monero was used to fund this act. You know, this van was bought and this is what happened and like 20 people died. And until we have that moment, I, I don't think that, um, I don't think Monero is, is, is it, it's safe for right now. I don't think anyone's going to come after it. It's going to be brought up. But I would say that the minute that you see that that happen, where there's some sort of way, like someone gives their view keys and it was shown that was connected, then that's when everyone's going to try to just throw Monero under the bus, you know, as a way of just, well, this is supposed to the currency, which is a problem. And, I, and that's why I hope that there's more conversations. I'd love to help the Monero community as they talk to folks in DC, because I think there's an argument for this type of privacy uh, that we still need and deserve, you know, and it's not the currency that's doing the crime, it's the people. Yeah, 100 percent. It's, it's just a tool. And unfortunately, uh, you know, a scenario like that is inevitable, right? So yeah. if Monero is really going to work as intended and be used on a global scale, uh, it's inevitably bad people are going to do bad things with it just like bad people do bad things with the internet, right? So it, it's that that's what boggles my mind too. It'd be the, the equivalent of sitting down and having a conversation about the internet in the early 90s or, you know, or late 80s and, and talking about all the potential bad things that the internet can be used for uh, without mentioning all the liberating things that, that it's obviously creating as well. So, uh, Fortunately, that that didn't really happen as much with the internet, uh, but we're we're seeing it quite a lot with with crypto, and because you know I think it's it's more disruptive uh, in a lot of ways than the internet was, and in that it's uh, directly going after you know who controls money. It's amazing uh, too when you think about the internet, because imagine back in like 1996 or seven. If there were these like chilling rules, like every website you visited had to be recorded and shared or say, saved. I mean, that's what we're talking about. We don't need to save every transaction. Exactly. Exactly. Well, uh, that that pretty runs the gamut of my questions. Is there anything you want to you want to talk about that I didn't bring up? Um, no, I think that, well, um, there is I, I don't think we've seen the end of the quote unquote discussion around anonymity enhanced cryptocurrencies and particularly Bitcoin. And I think we're going to see some stuff maybe later this week around the energy efficiency of things like Bitcoin and others that use proof of work mm -hmm. So for that later this week. But no, it was a pleasure coming on. I really enjoyed it and I uh, look forward to maybe coming back again and and talking all this great stuff about Monero and privacy. And, and I really appreciate your program, what you're doing for the community. Thank you, man. I guess if you don't mind, I'll, I'll ask kind of like a one last question. Where, so where do you see the space going? I, I think it's interesting that you had a lot of um, traditional finance experience, granted at, at a young age, but at a very important time in history. Uh, then you got into crypto. What do you see as being the trajectory of the space? Where, you know, where, where are we headed? Well, I think you're headed toward, you know, the institutional um, use of it in terms of investing and uh, i think it's going to continue to grow in market cap and size over the next five years i think you could see maybe uh i mean really maybe 50 trillion um you know in value which is just going to change everything for monero and for bitcoin um you'll see a lot of tighter regulations i think you'll see along that journey some major fight around anonymity enhanced cryptocurrencies where literally we're dealing with a bill that may become law um, but I think that uh, overall, though, the space is going to continue to grow. I think we'll just end up living in a side by side world where we have things like maybe digital cash along with our digital Bitcoin. And maybe if we're lucky, we can use Monero, too. Awesome, man. Thank you so much. Uh, perhaps offline, if you don't want to answer it now, but is, you know, maybe you could tell me some resources, other people I can talk to. Uh, you know, as I go further down this rapid hole of trying to figure out, are they going to try to really regulate Monero and, you know, who, who's, who's working on that? And I'd love to talk with them and have yeah. those discussions. 
Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, so where can where can people learn more about you if you want to if you want to just put that out there your Twitter uh, you know URLs that people can find you know what you're working on. Thank you. Yeah, I'm at, at Jason BTF um, on Twitter is my handle, and um, also on LinkedIn is Jason Brett. Um, and basically, ValueTechnology.org is our nonprofit that I'm the CEO and founder of. And you can find myself there as well as our team and our board of directors. And that's the best way to get in touch with us and keep up with what we have going on. Awesome. Thank you so much, man. Pleasure, pleasure meeting you on Clubhouse. And we started, we finally started a Monero club. So I, I was running some rooms, but now I finally got permission to create an official Monero club. We're doing it Congratulations. Saturday mornings at 10. So please, please jump in there if you can. I'd love to have you in, in the in the room. Will do. You know, my first, I realized how disruptive Clubhouse was. And one of the first guests I had on just a regular room was Rich Ricardo about Monero, Ricardo Spagni. So, oh, amazing. Yeah, yeah. So um, definitely, uh, that, that's great that you're doing that. That's really, I'll be sure to stop by the room. Awesome. Thank you, man. Absolutely. All right. Cheers. All right. All right. Hey, well, thanks so much. And um, let me just think about a few other resources and I'll follow up with you offline, you know, um, in terms of uh, what other groups and ways to help with with what you're looking to do in D.C. Thank you so much, man. Yeah, of course. Thank All you. Right. Have a great one. Thank you for joining us on this week's episode. We release new episodes every week. You can find and subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Play, YouTube, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you have an Alexa device, you can tell it to listen to the latest episode of the Monero Talk podcast. Go to monerotalk.live slash subscribe for a full list of places where you can watch and listen. If you want to interact with us, guests, or other podcast listeners, you can follow us on Twitter. And please leave us a review on iTunes. It helps people find the show, and we are always happy to read them. So thanks so much, and we look forward to being back next week.